Hey, so I wanted to explain a few things and, and all of the things I'm going to talk about uh, are the result of about 42 years of experience. And what I want to explain is that everything I'm about to say is impossible to learn without context. So context is essentially impossible without experience. What does that mean? Well, let's, let's use a couple of, of examples. Let's, let's use an, an easy one. Um, I was talking to my sister the other, the other day, and we were discussing the same physics class we took in high school. Now, when I went to high school, and this was one of the best professors or teachers that we had, um, and his last name was Smith, and he would start out, you know, once a week or so, uh, he would start out with this idea that there is no free lunch. Now, I didn't know it at the time, but this is something that he was borrowing from a libertarian, Milton Friedman. And we didn't know it at the time, but we could tell now, I can see now where he got that idea, what he was trying to say, and what he was trying to impart. And so that's the first thing you want to realize, is that when you're younger, you're getting this information from teachers or adults who are really tasked, if civilization is to survive, with the idea of creating either a transparent or a better path for the next generation, for the following generation. And so I was talking to my sister about this, Professor, and you know she, she mentioned that she'd never heard of this speech. And in fact, I said, well, well, didn't you see the little dot matrix banner that he put on top of the chalkboard uh, that said there is no free lunch? She said, no, I don't remember any of this. What are you talking about? So it dawned on me that somebody had probably complained. Uh, he had a sharp sense of humor, um, and nobody minded. Because again, context, we knew this was a good man. And furthermore, we knew he was much smarter than we were, and didn't, didn't have a mean bone in his body. So what had probably happened is that somebody complained, and he had to take down the banner. You know, somebody must have said, this is a physics class, not a political class. And somebody... You know, an adult standing in at the time probably realized that he was borrowing something from a libertarian e economist that the adult at that time did not agree with. So, Mr. Smith takes down the banner. My sister does not get the lecture. Suddenly, there's sort of this gap in the time-space continuum uh, you know, that cuts off a shared experience. But in order for me to understand that, I would have had to, I have to have a link to the past. That's what family is supposed to do. And so you can see how context here is something that moves based on demographics, based on complaints, and so on. And the thing with Mr. Smith is that because he's a nice guy, that's precisely the kind of person who's going to say, if faced with a complaint by a principal, you know, is going to say, well, you know what, my job is to teach physics. I like doing this, it makes me happy to you know, add something on, but at the end of the day, I'm someone who's law-abiding, and if, if this is something that they don't want, then I'm gonna, I'll just have to sacrifice it. But that's not gonna stop him from going to his church, and I, I assume with the last name Smith that he's Mormon. Um, and so, you know, we had a small Mormon community in my district. And so I assume that, you know, that didn't, but it doesn't stop there. I assume, this is a long time ago, probably 25 years ago, I assume that at that at that time, or 20 years ago, Mr. Smith then goes to his stake, his church, and ex explains this. And at that time, you can see how things like free speech, things like, you know, you can see how there would be an element of division. Because everyone knows Mr. Smith. Everyone knows this is a good guy and someone who is competent. And not somebody you can easily replace. Because it's not easy to just get physics teachers from anywhere. Especially not people who are you know, who present the material in a way that's understandable. And he liked physics. You can tell. You can always tell when someone's mailing it in, trying to wait for that pension to kick in, and, and when somebody actually cares about the material. And so you can create this example and explain this story to show that over time we seem to have lost context. Now, again, that's impossible without having experience and without having that link to the past. And so what is the purpose of being an adult? The purpose of being an adult is to try to create, again, the, the ability to look back and to try to show different examples in order to create not just a storyline, but also a path of ethics moving forward. 
that can be discussed within context. And it's more and more difficult for adults because by the time you become 40, uh, you, most people have kids, they have debt, they're not really free. People in debt are not really free. And over time, you know, costs have increased. And so it's very difficult to live a life today with enough time and enough cash, um, you know, to really try to study and, you know, and try to move into that role of being a helpful assistant to the younger generation. And by helpful assistant, I'm not using that in a condescending way. I'm using that to show that this example may explain from 25 years ago, the rise of people who are pol politicians who are politically incorrect, like Donald Trump. And, the, and you can see that, it, you know, without this example, or, you know, it's very, it's, it's easy to see the phenomenon of a political, in, of, of a politically incorrect politician, um, with all the other warts that come with it. Um, you know, you can see that, you know, it's, it's not a one-time thing. It's something that builds up over time. If we don't have that, that example, and I only have one of the, one of those examples, but I can assume that this has happened over time. If it happened in, in one school district with, a, with this professor, who was excellent, it probably happened over time with other teachers, and it built up into not only a division of opinions, but a division of experience without the proper guides, adult guides, to lead everyone, including the adults, into a community-based, you know, sort of cohesive response. So you can look at that, look at the result, and, and you can only try to figure out the breakdown of community and trust and context uh, if you have that connection to the past, uh, as well as the ability to just put all those pieces together. You know, Milton Friedman, Mormon, Republicans, Mitt Romney, all these things coming up, and the, the rise of the Mormonist political establishment, and so on. Another example of context and, and, and the need for experience. Um, I'm now in Singapore, and you can see this, this is a German flag, and this is a really cool, this is like a, basically a, a vitamin C tablet. You put it in water, um, and you dissolve it. And I saw this, and the packaging is fantastic, it's really unique. So I saw this a while ago, you can see how it just pops open. One of the problems in Asia is that they, they know how to make the product, but they don't know how to make the packaging. And it's, it's really quite strange. Um, and, and it shows you that marketing to, consumer, to consumers um, you know, may not be as profitable as you might expect, uh, but is also more difficult than you might expect. Um, now, the reason I bring up this example is because I saw this exact same product in Iran, uh, or from Iran, many years ago, uh, at least 10 years ago. So when I look at this, this represents a lot of things to me. First of all, it represents an improvement. The one that I had was only vitamin C. This one is vitamin B um, and minerals as well. Uh, so it's got a lot of things. The one that I had was basically ascorbic acid, uh, vitamin C, and, and this one has a lot of other things as well. Uh, so it's, there's an improvement. Um, but when you look at this in context of things like intellectual property, of, in, of intellectual property debates, it's very difficult to see what's going on here because uh, you have a Singaporean-owned retail store with a German product, and I don't know exactly where this is manufactured. The print is too small. Um, but what's going on here? Is, is Germany copying an Iranian product? I've been to Germany before, I wanna, uh, and I've been to you know, Germany recently. Um, and I can, so I can probably assume, based on my experience, that this product was made, or at least the design for it, was at least made in Iran. But what's really going on? Is it, is it that Iran copied Germany? Or is it the other way around? And, you know, am I ever going to be able to figure that out? So the reason that we have these legal structures is precisely to be able to figure these things out. Um, but you can't figure these things out. Um, I'm looking at my limited, you know, sort of limited experience. I haven't been everywhere in Germany. Uh, the Saxony region is completely different from all the other regions. But I've been to Berlin. I think I would have noticed something like this. But maybe I didn't, you know, I went through a day. I went to the store on a day when, you know, it was out of stock or so on. So I, even with my experience across different geographies over 20 years, I still can't know for sure who's copying whom. All I know is this is a very unique product. Um, and so it, it represents something where I know that intellectual property debates are a little bit, or at least have to include the possibility of uneven enforcement because you know, I don't, I'm not sure there's a license for this particular packaging, or maybe there's a, a packaging company that distributes to both Iran and Germany. Um, but which, you know, but in order for me to find that out, I would have to look at the manufacturer and go online and then try to reverse sort of look up 
all the different, you know, um, deals they have and all the different structures. And if you do that, you'll notice very quickly that it's almost impossible to figure out the uh, a transparent um, corporate system. Uh, because in fact, most, you know, if you're, even if you're an American company, uh, when you do business in a, in a foreign country or an outside of your own country, uh, you have a subsidiary that's based in that location. Um, and sometimes during, especially since 1945, uh, you know, a lot of these companies were nationalized. Like, for example, I think that Bayer, uh, or one of the German pharmaceutical companies, um, Merck, I think used to be German, was founded by a German and then changed. It was a multinational company based in Germany, it was doing business in America, and then after the war, there might have been some confiscation or, or so on. Um, and so just in this one little thing, you can, if you really want to look at it, you know, you can look at it also in the sense that, um, you know, it, maybe the Germans have a, have a better reputation for not copying. Uh, and so maybe somebody who is Iranian, who has dual citizenship, went to Iran, found the design, took it back to Germany, and manufactured in Germany, and then decided to reinvest or at least buy a license from that inventor in Iran. Or you can say that actually Iran is outside of the of the legal system that we're talking about, um, and so it, it's you know a little bit easier to copy Iranian products and not give any licensing. Um, and we can see that with things like Shiraz wine, which is actually Australian. Um, you know, I don't think the, the, the Aussies are paying a license or are paying any fees to Iran for the name of that wine. So you see right away that this, when people talk about law and order, if you actually understand the law, it's extremely difficult because the law no longer provides transparency. This has, you know, this context can also be used for things like disputes between Korea and Japan. Korea is well known for copying Japanese innovation. Um, whether it's the uh, the fancy toilets or a lot of other things. And, and ironically, this puts Korea at a, at a little bit of a, a superior uh, position because if you, you know, this is why intellectual property is so heavily disputed because, you know, on the one hand, if you're a developing country, uh, you know, you don't, you can't afford to get something that might be like a life-saving medicine. And so this is clearly a sort of a moral issue there that might trump the amount of investment and debt this company came up with uh, in order to invent this vaccine or something else. Um, but in the case of Korea, they, it's, it, it's not the other way around. So the Koreans actually make the best espresso-based coffee uh, in the whole world now. People think it's Italy. It's not. Not anymore. It's actually in Korea. And I still don't know why, uh, but it's not the other way around in Japan. The, the coffee in Japan is terrible. The espresso, as well as the coffee, actually. Um, you know, and so you sort of see that it's, it's, it's a one-way sort of system, whereas, you know, a toilet in Korea in a fancy hotel or, or in a fancy convention center is just a copy of the, of the one that, that, that we've seen in Japan from 10 years ago. Um, but, you know, the advantage, of course, is that based on the currency, uh, the, 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 the Korean toilet can be exported a little bit easier because either the Korean won is, is a little bit cheaper to buy, depending on what country, than the, than the Japanese yen. Uh, but also, of course, they don't have to put, put up the total investment to create that kind of a product. And they may be able to, able to piggyback off of Japanese marketing. Um, and so right away when people accuse in the United States of China of copying U.S. products, uh, you can see right away that it's extremely complex because you have this attempt at a law and order system that doesn't actually create stability or, a, or consistent enforcement. And it's even more interesting in context when you think about all these Western European systems that stole through, through colonization uh, natural resources of other countries. Uh, whether it's Spain stealing Mexican silver, um, you know, the British essentially uh, stealing Iranian oil uh, through a coup, uh, you know, through a political upheaval and chaos that prevented nationalization. Um, you can see all of these factors coming together. But without context, if someone tells you that China is copying American technology or innovation, without context, it's almost impossible to, impossible to figure out you know, what was really going on, but it's also easier to hate the other side. Okay, someone's, that's unfair. That's a principle. That's unfair. And the whole point of adults in context is to show that most of the things that we complain about have been happening in some form or another for centuries because human beings are all fundamentally the same. And so that's one of the reasons that we're able to, uh, you know, have similar experiences or look at a book that was written by Shakespeare 400 years ago uh, and still have in, in, in almost a different language, even if you speak English, and still have a common experience. It's not an accident. 
So the point of all this, I want to segue now into two recent Supreme Court decisions that came out in the United States. And uh, one of them, uh, well, one of them is not so recent. One of them was USA versus Hawaii. And in that decision, uh, what ended up happening was, I think it was a 5-4 decision. Uh, so five people voted in favor of upholding the uh, uh, executive order by Trump that banned uh, you know, incoming uh, immigrants or refugees from certain countries. Um, and, you know, you've got that five people uh, you know, that promoted that, upheld that, versus four people that did not. And what's interesting is that recently, um, you know, you have a situation where the Supreme Court ruled that the word sex in Title VII, which is an anti-discrimination statute uh, in, in the job market, also uh, extends into uh, people who, have, uh, who are homosexual or who have a different sexual orientation uh, than, the, than you know, the heterosexuals. Um, and so you can see that the Supreme Court was able to expand its definition um, you know, in order to protect this minority, but it didn't do the same thing with this other minority, which was Muslims in the United States and abroad, although it doesn't have any obligation to any Muslims abroad. Um, and so you, you can see, however, that you, in the one sense, in USA versus Hawaii, there was a dissenting opinion by Justice Sotomayor that clearly set out a bias by the executive against this group, and then compared that to the, to the number of, of, of countries that were being set, held to a much higher standard than other countries, and was able to then argue that this is not really based on a content-neutral enforcement decision, this is based on the religion itself. Um, and that is the primary connect, you know, connector between all these different decisions and essentially discrimination. The court, the same court, said, nah, well, uh, oh, sorry, it wasn't the same court. But it, was, it wasn't the same justices, it was the same court, but not the same people. Um, they said, nah, well, you know, it's tough luck, basically. Now, what, what happened? And one of the things we, when we talk about law and order is that we don't realize that what we believe that law and order in the legal system is actually based on the information you see. So if you have somebody on the court that has positive images coming in of people who are gay or transgender, uh, that person is probably more likely to say, well, this is a group that doesn't deserve to be treated differently. Uh, on, you know, if the executive dictates or, or directs the uh, federal agencies to do a certain thing, um, you know, which was to, in this case to allow discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation, uh, the Supreme Court can step in and say that's not acceptable. But that really, again, you can see that it depends on that person's, you know, experiences. Now, you can see that if you present somebody who is going to make that decision with all kinds of pictures and, and you know, content uh, that show people, this minority group, in a negative light, you can see how things might change. So, once again, we see that law and order, because it ultimately is based on a human, it's just human decisions, can be influenced by a lot of things. The beliefs are influenced by data, and that's why data has become the most valuable asset of all. Because uh, if you can control what people see, you can oftentimes control how they vote. And if you can, if you can control how they vote, you're able to, at that point, direct budgets uh, towards your own favored voting bloc or your own favored people. And that, unfortunately, is what politics has become. Why, why is that significant? It's significant because, again, not only uh, re relating to the idea that adults are supposed to be this conduit that helps the younger generation move forward, but um, in a transparent way or a better way. Uh, it's, not, it's not as if all adults can succeed all the time, uh, but the idea is to be transparent. And you can see how it's become much more difficult with debt, with a lack of legal transparency, and so on. Um, and so if, the, if you are supposed to be in a position today where you're supposed to be optimistic, how can you be optimistic when the liberals have totally failed or at least have lost credibility by being inconsistent? And the way that you can move forward is by, first of all, understanding, understanding what it means to be a liberal. A liberal is, is somebody who is supposed to argue that the human, human experience is something that is universal. Not that the law is universal, um, but the human, that the human experience is a universal one. And so in order to understand it, we have to understand history. And in order to understand that, we have to be able to create content that is helpful to the next generation. I was trying to under understand the same questions that all of us understood. 
And that's more difficult when that physics professor can't put his side of the story or his opinion out there, even though he has credibility. That's even more difficult when people don't even know what's happening because they're too far removed from the area, either by age or by location. And that's why we have government. We have a central government that's supposed to try to fix all these things uh, or at least hear people out and then create a resolution through a forum for being heard. But it turns out that the larger the geographic area and the more diverse, the more diversity that you have, the more difficult it is to do just that. And so you see that in Singapore, which is very diverse, that the diversity is not the problem because Singapore is, has probably the most successful government in the whole world. Um, and it can't be diversity because this place is very diverse. Uh, it's got about 20% immigrant population. Um, it's got, you know, Tamils from India, um, intellectuals from India as well. Um, you know, uh, not, Tamils are also intellectuals. It's just that they have a reputation within Singapore for um, coming in through the shipbuilding uh, industry. And so a lot of the, the Indians that you see here are very large, they're very big and tall compared to the ones you see in the, in the U.S. who come from an, uh, typically from either an, an intellectual or an, or an engineering background, who tend to be not within that shipbuilding industry, who, are, who may be from different parts of India, and not that Tamil region, um, or not, not Sri Lanka. And so also different colors as well, um, and so on. Now, we have that, we have Malays, we have, um, you know, Chinese, obviously. Um, you know, you put all that together, you can see that if this country is successful, it's clearly not because of diversity or immigration. And not only that, but it's not just ordinary people that come here to work. Um, the co-founder of Facebook, Saverin, who's Brazilian, uh, he, he's also Singaporean. I believe that the inventor of the Dyson vacuum also decided to move his company to Singapore and so on. Uh, so if, if we know that diversity can't be the problem, uh, because if it was, Singapore would not be in the position that it's in today. So we know that it has to be something else. And what that is, is of course, geography. Um, it's just, it's more difficult to govern when you have a lot of space because your ability to access information is reduced. So what's really happening here is that's why you have adults. Adults are supposed to be the ones to try to fill in that gap, you know, uh, and to try to help connect in a way, in a way of holding hands from your city that's very far away from the central government. You're trying to hold hands with everyone in that community all the way back to the central government to try to create a solution to the extent that, you, that the local government is either inept or just unwilling to, you know, move beyond its, you know, lobby group or its lobbying um, or its self-interest in order to create a solution. And that's not happening. That's why you see total failures all over the world today. It's not restricted to one thing. It's, it's really, at the, at the end of the day, it's a, a global failure. Because once again, you've got that lack of transparency, uh, you've got uh, people in debt we don't, that don't have a lot of time to do, to do that act of, you know, of being able to create a link that helps the central government determine what to do. Or even in this case, today in a big city, even the local government. So without that, you see right away that democracy is in peril. So how do you fix it? Well, one of the things, again, is you want to look at things like capitalism. Now, capitalism was never meant to be... Um, and I am a capitalist. It was never meant to be uh, something that was unmoored from morality. If you actually go back and look at all the capitalists, all the founders of the United States, they all had this idea of morality being the, the sort of the, 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 the glue that held, that would fill in the gaps uh, where capitalism would fail. And so the, the idea was that uh, capitalism would, uh, would create inequality. And, you know, how do we fix that? Because the idea of capitalism... Uh, is that people are elevated to the top um, and are given a greater share of the financial pie based on merit. Uh, that creates disadvantages because merit is not equally distributed. And so we have to fix that by doing things like charity, by having religious institutions get more involved, uh, and so on and so forth. Things like education and so on and so forth. That's clearly no longer the case. There is no, no one in the, in the U.S. today after two trillion dollar bailouts uh, that actually believes that whoever is in power anywhere uh, is there because of merit. And this creates a problem because, you know, if, if you want to go back and look at what uh, Karl Marx was saying, I mean, you know, one of the things is that most people have never read Karl Marx. 
Uh, they've, never, they've never read Adam Smith, but they still want to talk about, um, you know, they want to talk about capitalism and socialism. Um, and I don't want to bore you with those discussions, you know, about how socialism was supposed to come after capitalism failed. It wasn't supposed to be the initial starting point. But um, I want to give you another example. Um, you know, the, we now live in a society where we have tons of information, but we don't have necessarily the, the ability to access the source. So one of, one of the reasons is obviously it's in a different language. It might be in German. Um, and so the one thing that you, get, you learn as you get older is to put things in context. And, and the way you do that is to first of all realize that if you're writing or learning something in, in English, the most you're, you're going to be able to distribute in terms of knowledge is about is to five percent of the world population. That that's it, uh, and I'm being optimistic. Um, so <laughs> you're looking not the five percent of, of the world speaks English fluently or reads English fluently. It's just a matter of getting that information there. And so um, you can look at that in, in something and say, well, this is why we have movies and so on. And, and you know, you, you look at this and and you try to realize, you know, what's happening because you're the farther away you move from the source material, the easier it is to get into these discussions that don't really go anywhere um, when you're arguing on things like principle as opposed to historical examples. So this worked in the past, it didn't work. How can we replicate this and so on? And so this really gets problematic with, with economic systems because things are so different, you know, ge geographically and, and, you know, and people are, are in different stages of development uh, and countries and cities and so on. Now, what the other example I'll give is that people will, will watch a Disney movie like Aladdin, um, and you know they'll but they won't read you know a thousand a thousand and one nights. They won't be able to make that connection between the Disney movie of Aladdin and the story. One of the reasons is because the original story is, is in a different is it in a different language, um, and so you you think about context and how difficult it is. The first thing you realize is you have to be humble because you don't have access to that unless you speak multiple languages fluently, you don't have access to that source material. And the minute you understand that, not only that, but just, you know, the fact that, you know, East and West, you know, you're looking at more of a visual language when you go farther East, where, you know, where the language almost looks like a picture uh, or, or a sketch, um, you know, at least to Western eyes. But the minute you go west to Switzerland, you're into a totally different system where you have a lot, you know a different way of speaking and writing that is almost very, you know, impossible to translate. And so that's why I say at most, if I write something or say something, at most I'm looking to reach 5% of the population of the whole world, which tells you once again why local relationships are so important, why every adult has a purpose uh, in terms of helping the next generation in an honest and transparent way. And the movie Aladdin, if you think about it, it might not be such a good example because Disney does do a good job. They, they do a lot of research before they make a movie. Um, they may, you know, if you look at, um, you know, there was a movie about the uh, Mexican holiday, Day of the Dead, uh, Dia, Dia uh, de los Muertos. Very good, very good movie. Um, but let's go back to Aladdin. And one of the things that you'll realize is that the villain was called Jafar, if, if I remember it correctly. Well, it turns out there is, um, it was a bad decision to, to make that the villain's name because uh, there is actually a sect within Islam called the Jafari. Uh, and I'm, I'm butchering the pronunciation, I'm sure. Um, and, you know, once again, I'm dealing with a script. And so if you're not fluent, you're not going to be able to get, you know, you're not going to be able to access that information. And I have to believe that if you're somebody in Disney, that if you, if you had known about that, um, you know, you wouldn't have named that character that name because it would be insulting and that Disney is not in the business of trying to divide people. Once again, you can see that even if you do a lot of research, there's always that element, there's always that sort of, you know, outlier that you're not, not going to necessarily be able to, uh, you know, access. And that's a problem because if you look at things like the scientific method, like Karl Popper, uh, another philosopher, you know, he says that you, in order to prove something, you have to be able to first make sure that, that, you know, it can be, you have to be able to falsify. Um, and so in, in many cases, if, if it's not enough simply to, uh, you have to sort of be able to prove it wrong sometimes in order to see where there are gaps within that principle. And if you don't have access not only to the language, uh, you know, but, you know, you can see right away that you're not going to have access to a, even 5% of the world's information uh, in order to do something, even if you have Disney's money. So again, the principal idea of adults is to show people that 
you know, you're not going to necessarily, you know, be able to gain all the information within your lifetime. Um, and so that requires some sort of humility and desire to try to connect some sort of universal experience. In the case of the Supreme Court, you can see that it was wrong for the Supreme Court to allow this executive order to function because it weakens not only, you know, the ability of Muslims within the country uh, to feel American, but also because we know that if it had been, uh, if, if Trump had done the same thing but singled out, um, you know, Christian minorities, for, for example, Jehovah's Witnesses, um, you know, or, or in particular countries. I mean, this is an impossible example because there are no countries with majority Jehovah's Witnesses. So uh, we have to sort of become a little bit philosophical. If he had done something else, we know that, you know, it would be much more difficult for the, Supreme, for the Supreme Court to do what it did because you would be tapping into a human element. Um, and the Supreme, Supreme Court, I believe, is, is actually, it is majority it's 100% uh, it, it's, uh, Judeo-Christian. So you go back and you see right away, um, you know, your own experience, your access to data, all these things are, uh, you know, create what we consider to be law and order, but not in any sort of consistent way. And the reason for that is because our education systems have failed. Everything is failing right around, all, all around us. We don't necessarily see it as a result of something that happened 25 years ago. Uh, we see it as something that happened yesterday or four years ago, and that's another problem. And we can look at all sorts of things. Um, you know, so if you look at, say, this idea that the universal experience is designed to make us see outside of ourselves, uh, and that's the first job of a liberal, is to try to show you that what you believe was really, uh, at most, based on 5% of the world's information, um, and that should give you some humility. And when that humility, and the, the real second step as liberal is to say that humility ought to put you in a position where, you know, you are going to favor the minority, um, you know, vulnerable minority uh, over the majority, and then, and then demand the executive branch, uh, you know, create a system that guarantees or maximizes security. In other words, if the government comes in and says that we think that people from these countries represent a higher risk, uh, because their countries don't have the same, they don't share data, uh, they, their birth certificates are, you know, easily forged, and so on. Well, the idea isn't to sort of defer to the executive branch. If you have a liberal outlook, the idea is not to blindly say, that's, that's, that's you know, not, not my, that's not part of my jurisdiction. The idea is to say, but you can do interviews, you have experts, we, you know, you can come in, and there are ways of, you know, overcoming these sorts of hurdles and obstacles that don't put us in a position of, this, of discrimination openly. And in doing so, expose us and Western, you know, Western laws as being totally inconsistent, thereby creating more and more divisions. So if, if you look at that, you look at you know, the idea that of, of history being very, very important and you can see why it's also something that's, that's very rarely taught well, because uh, the same problems exist. In order to study, say, uh, the Third Reich, you have to probably speak German and English if you want to teach it to a Western audience. Very few people would do that, at least not at a high school level. And so right away, you can sort of see why so many people that were outside the system in the U.S. were the ones that were correct. So you have a situation where Muhammad Ali doesn't go to college, um, you know, is more right about the Vietnam War than all the experts with PhDs at RAND or the military. Um, we know that now. Yeah, but again, you know, why is that the case? It must be the case that our history has been taught incorrectly. Um, it's also, or at least incompletely. Malcolm X, again, um, you know, we've got a problem there uh, in terms of, you know, uh, of having somebody with very little formal education goes to jail suddenly becomes probably the best speaker in the, in the U.S. at the time, even above Martin Luther King, uh, in terms of being able to put things in context. Um, and of course, that's not who you see. That's not who the media, you know, um, distributes at the time to the, to the mass public. Uh, the only person that gave him an, a, an interview was Playboy magazine, um, and that was it. It wasn't as if he was getting interviews in Life magazine or something else that would have been more accessible. 
So not only are we in a position where the people who were living alive at the time probably didn't know who Malcolm X was, and, the, and because they didn't know who Malcolm X was, they probably looked at Muhammad Ali as, you know, in a very foreign or incomplete way. They couldn't understand what was going on because in order to understand Muhammad Ali, it would be helpful to understand that, you know, Malcolm X, because you would have a way of, of looking back towards the teacher that helped teach both of them within the nation of Islam. And then you can also go back, and once you understand that, see why Malcolm X left. Um, and then you can also see, perhaps, why Muhammad Ali stayed. Um, and you can, but you have to, even in one language, you can see how you have to be able to make these connections. And once again, there's, the act of making those connections is context. And you have to have adults and educators who are honest and, about their own limitations, uh, but who are also in a position to be able to make those connections based on their experience. And I think that's the guide. Uh, the, the adult as, as guide uh, has collapsed simply because things are obviously not working anymore. So why should the younger, the younger generation listen to the older generation? And once you have that, everything else you see is a consequence of that breakdown between the older and the younger generation. And you can't, you know, and what we're doing now is we're trying to fix the results of that breakdown rather than the source, which is why I think we're not going to necessarily create a, um, you know, a better society, you know, within the U.S. at least, at least not, and, and at least not within my lifetime. Because we're not yet able to understand that all the systems have had to fail over a long period of time in order to be in the position we're in today. So, uh, you can see, again, it's a worldwide problem. Even Germany, uh, which has done a remarkable job uh, confronting its own history in multiple languages um, and everywhere you go, What's happened in Germany is, is a little bit interesting because the, the realization uh, by white Germans of their role in history uh, has caused a breakdown in dialogue. There's less dialogue now. Um, and, you know, at least, you know, people don't necessarily want to move on. But what ends up happening is because that history has made the Germans more humble, they tend to do more, they tend to do more listening when talking to somebody who's a foreigner. And you don't have that dialogue, which is the whole point of having education. You're supposed to have that idea of a transparent dialogue. And you're not supposed to be in a position where one party feels as if they don't have a voice just because their history has been taught too well. And so you see that, you know, even in, in places that have heeded uh, the lessons that I've talked about, they're having problems as well. And that then leads to a lot of other issues. It, it allows extremists to come in uh, because the more you put someone like Mr. Smith from high school in the corner, uh, the more you have these factions that are forming, because that story doesn't get buried, it just goes someplace else. It goes into a dark, darker place that's harder to access. This is the result. This is why you're supposed to have adults. This is why you're supposed to restrain yourselves um, in terms of things like volatile statements that do not contribute to stability. It's also a historical lesson. And so, in fact, you know, the real issue is that almost everything in society is a proxy for something else. Money is supposed to be a proxy for stability and innovation. Um, you know, religion is supposed to be a proxy for, has become, uh, was supposed to be a proxy for thinking uh, and, and intellectualism, but it's actually become a proxy for uh, voting uh, blocks that then lead into economic power. Uh, and you can see that, especially in the U.S. with the Catholic Church. Um, and so you can look around and suddenly you have this, so many things that are supposed to actually bind society together to try to glue together the gaps in capitalism. They're not gluing anything together anymore. They're actually gluing themselves together in terms of economic power in, in the darker corners of society, which has now led to extremism. And it, it's, it's also led to a breakdown in just communication because you look at something like the, the Israeli-Palestinian crisis, and what that is is essentially one one the stronger party uh, taking and marginal taking the land of a weaker party and marginalizing the weaker party in the process in the name of security. And you know you can see when you look at people who are um, trying to argue that it's religion. Uh, first of all, there are, Judaism and Islam clearly have more in common than Judaism and Christianity and Islam and Christianity, uh, not just in the, the avoidance of pork, circumcision. Um, my God, there's so many things in common. It's just, uh, um, 
I mean, they're both Semitic. The languages, by the way, are almost the same, Arabic and, and Hebrew. Uh, the, the alphabet in Hebrew for A is, I believe it's, it's Alif, Aleph, or I don't know how to pronounce it, but it's spelled that way. And then in Arabic, it's Alif. It's, it's, it's a different one. Al sorry, it's Aleph. Um, and so, you know, I may be confusing the two. Um, but you can see how in order to really understand that, to jump the hurdle, uh, when someone tells you, no, it's religion that's really causing the problems here, if you don't know even the basic language, the alphabet, it's harder to sort of, you know, or the prohibition on pork, it's harder to sort of, you know, um, you know, the, the, I mean, it's just unbelievable, right? The, um, it's just in, if, if you think it's religion, especially because if you all at the same time believe in in some sort of Judeo or Christian, um, you know, uh, similarity, simply because you know, it's, in fact, the, Jude, the Jews and the Muslims uh, have a different interpretation of what Jesus Christ represented as opposed to um, mainstream Christians, including the Catholic Church. Um, and, and that's not true of all Christians. You Jehovah's Witnesses, Seventh-day Adventists, they also have a similar interpretation as the Muslims and the Jews. Um, and you, what you're really looking at here is, you know, in order to get all these things right, it's not just a language barrier that we've been totally um, inept in overcoming in the West. Um, it, it's not only a failure of adults, it's a failure of the majority to use all these structures in the way that they were intended, in the way that they were intended. Uh, so education is no longer really about educating people if you don't have people in, in position to, to impart wisdom, uh, or if not really, especially not if you're silencing people, um, it's just because you don't want them to be political, even if they have a lot of credibility. Um, and you're not, in a, you know, we, the majority has, under these circumstances, almost always been wrong, right? It's, it's, it's Malcolm X that knows more about foreign policy than the White House. It's Muhammad Ali that, that interprets the war in Vietnam more correctly than the federal government. Uh, these are all minorities. And what you see for sure, one thing you can say for sure today in 2020 is, is that it's actually the minorities that have been the most honest and the most intelligent um, in, in terms of being able to understand what's happening. And, you know, that's, that's weird. That's, that's, that's something that's very odd. And, you know, it, it, it's, it's, not, it's not that it shouldn't be that way, but it should, there should be more of a connection where the experiences and therefore the data and therefore, you know, the resolutions are not so far apart. And again, one of the problems is again is translation. If you know, if you look at Anthony Bourdain, um, you know he's got some French background, but when he speaks, it's almost untranslatable. And uh, so I, I wouldn't be surprised if you go to China if nobody knows about him. Oh well, not nobody, right? But if, if the majority of people don't know about him, um, simply because if you look at the language, it's, it's, it's spectacular. Uh, but you almost have to be a New Yorker to really understand it, because he'll say he'll compare somebody uh, who's the owner of a restaurant who's particularly gregarious and business savvy. He'll say. She is a cross between a yenta and a six-shooter Gambino family hoodlum. Amazing. But you have to... I mean, it's unbelievable, right? There's no question Bourdain was just, you know, unbelievable. But you have to speak English and you have to know and then American English to understand what's going on and make that connection between the Gambinos and the, Sicily, and the Sicilian mob uh, to then have, you know, the six-shooter... Uh, to realize that you're going even farther back into the sort of the Godfather Mafia times with an ordinary weapon. Um, you have to have some experience with what the word dienta means in a positive light in terms of bringing people together. Um, there's no way to translate that easily in any context unless you're from the United States. Um, and it would be too difficult to do it uh, unless you know somebody. And that ultimately is the answer, right? The adults are supposed to be the ones that, that you know, watch these things and have these shared experiences and then try to help connect language and people together. So all these things, like money, they're all proxies for economic systems, so that the Israeli-Palestinian issue is not a religious issue. It's really a failure of both diplomacy and economics, because you have a, a situation where after the 1950s, uh, Pakistan and India had a two-state solution. Um, who else had a two-state solution? Singapore and Malaysia, two-state solution. They don't call it that, but that's what it is. Uh, the British were trying to, trying to connect them. There was a separation. It was a two-state solution. When you look at it in that context, right, suddenly the Israelis you know, and the Palestinians not agreeing to a two-state solution, you can see how that's really the source of what has happened um, today, you know, where you, you don't necessarily have peace between Pakistan and India, um, but it's certainly better than the situation in Israel today. 
uh, with respect to a lot of different things. Uh, look at Singapore and Malaysia, there's definitely peace, uh, despite the fact that Singapore actually received training uh, from the Israeli military, at least at, at its in, in the 1960s. Um, and again, totally different circumstances uh, in terms of the relationships with their neighbors. So, again, you have to know all these different things, right? You have to know history, and nobody, since nobody talks about Malaysia and Singapore agreeing to a two-state solution, you have to be able to connect that between the India, Pakistan, and then what's currently being you know, offered to the, the Middle Eastern parties. And there's very, I've never heard anybody do that except for myself. Uh, that's weird to me. That's odd. It tells me that the adults have no clue what's going on. Uh, but but it also makes sense because in order to understand what's going on, you have to have the time to read all these things. I mean, you may be an expert on India and, and Pakistan, but in order to connect that to different things, just the fact that of the humility involved, right? You have to be somewhat certain uh, that there's a connection. In order to get there, it probably takes about 42 years to get there, which, as we all know, in the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, that's the meaning of life, right? That's the first age that you can start to create your own meaning of life. That's not what he probably meant, we don't know. He wasn't 42 when he wrote it, it was much younger. Uh, but that's, that's why I suspect, I can guess that he borrowed it from somebody else who might have thought about the same things. Um, and so, once again, you have a, a really interesting situation where we have a t breakdown because society itself has failed to you know, create these economic structures that bring us together. And everything is a represent it should be a representation of something else that represents stability, innovation, cooperation. So the sport of basketball is not just bouncing a ball. It's something that brings us together. It's, it's an opportunity for interaction with people that you wouldn't ordinarily meet. A job, same thing, right? But it's also supposed to be something that allows you to, to create a sense, of, a sense of stability at home um, and the idea that you're creating a better life overall. All these things is are representations for something else, but they fail to be what the representations were supposed to mean. They become something else. And until all these things, all these things together, until they get fixed, uh, it's very unlikely um, that we're going to get that proper balance between humility and context, especially today, when at least in the West, uh, debt is just sort of, you know, uh, consumer debt and educational debt, all these things are sort of uh, it's just a fact of life to the point where, you know, in order for me to someone to understand law, it's just, the trend towards specialization is also something that's that's a little bit troubling, uh, because in order to be able to have the, the ability to speak generally, to get that sort of Rosetta Stone that allows you to talk about something, but without having but without being an expert on everything, um, you have to have you know at least as a lawyer, right? You have to have experience in federal court, state court local tribunals. So when you look at a Supreme Court decision, you can see what's really going on, right? There's an interpretation of an, of an executive order that applies to federal agencies like the EEOC, um, but then you also have state, state agencies like the DFEH in California, um, and then you look at how they're interpreted. Um, you know, you, <laughs> there's a different system in San Francisco with commissioners versus San Jose, which is one hour away. You see all these things coming together, but you have to have people that are able to connect it together they can at least try to provide the framework, but even that that framework, that that you know sort of handholding um, for one, from one generation to the next, as well as your own colleagues, you know, even if you put that, even if you accomplish that, which is very difficult, the bigger the territory, the more diverse people are, uh, very difficult. You still have to have integrity and stability within these systems where people um, have the humility to realize that uh, having an extremist position. In and, of, in, in and of itself means you've gone astray somewhere at some point. And the fact that there are so many people who've gone astray, um, or at least appear to have gone, gone astray, uh, within the U.S. at this point in time in 2020, tells you that it's a breakdown in the entire ecosystem. And we ought to be able to try to figure out how to fix that.